So <clears throat> um, I had made the point that uh, lipoprotein, the job of lipoproteins is to deliver fats, triglycerides, fatty acids, uh, cholesterol, uh, to various peripheral tissues. This includes skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, uh, of course, back and forth from the liver, which is sort of the, like the, the chemical hub of all of this. Um, but then also uh, to the storage tissue called adipose tissue, fat, fat cells. Uh, what is adipose tissue? Well, uh, adipose tissue is a type of connective tissue. Uh, I'm going to, in just a moment, uh, when I get into the next set of slides, um, I will talk about what connective tissue is with you, uh, but adipose tissue is one of those uh, categories of connective tissues. Adipo, uh, adipose just means uh, fat, and uh, site uh, is cells, so they're fat cells. Adipocytes are fat cells. Uh, they are non-proliferative. That means fat cells do not divide. Uh, you don't, uh, if you gain weight, you don't gain more adipose cells, and if you lose uh, fat weight, uh, then you aren't losing fat cells. They're just growing, uh, expanding, or shrinking in size. Expanding and, and yeah. Size. Um, it has nothing to do with the number of cells. Uh, that has, that's a much more complicated discussion. Uh, and to, to really answer that question fully, I'd have to go through a, a longer discussion of physiology with you guys. Uh, so yeah, genetic predisposition towards uh, weight gain or loss is, um, we, can, we could possibly talk about that uh, after I talk about metabolism a little bit more, uh, but it, it has nothing to do with the number of cells that you have uh, in your body. Um, all right, so there are two types of fat. Uh, well, well, when you look at fat under, first of all, we'll say this, uh, when you look at uh, fat under a microscope, uh, which would be the one on the right-hand side, uh, it's a light micrograph at 133 times uh, the normal size, they just look like big white nothingness, uh, holes of a very low intensity. And that's because they're just packed with um, triglycerides and fatty acids to the point where it's pushed all the cellular contents, all the other stuff that's in the cell, uh, to the margin. The nucleus, any of the, uh, any of the uh, other uh, vesicular uh, components, the ER, the Golgi apparatus, any of the, um, the lysosomes or vacuoles of any sort, are all going to get shoved to the side uh, to make room for these large vacuoles that are full of uh, these free fatty acids. There are two types of fats, um, and uh, those are white fat and brown fat. Uh, white fat is uh, certainly the most common, and it is uh, essentially uh, all the fat that's on all of us in this room here. Uh, this is storage. Um, so both of them are storage, but uh, it also... Uh, provides shock absorption. Uh, it helps cushion your body against uh, various blows. For example, uh, in, in your stomach, have you guys ever seen those like, um, you know, like weightlifters or whatever that had, they can kind of have the six pack, you see, but they also have these giant guts and you're wondering how that's even possible. Uh, and so the, the muscle is on the surface and there is no fat on top of that like you would see on the surface of, you know, the, the stereotypical beer belly or something like that where there is no six-pack, uh, but uh, no abdominal muscles present. But underneath the layer of abdominal muscle, there's this fatty skirt called the omentum. Uh, this is just an example. It's called the omentum, and it's a fatty skirt that covers all your intestinal viscera. All the intestines are underneath this uh, fatty skirt called the omentum, and it protects the abdominal viscera against uh, blows and impacts. So when you see um, those people, oftentimes, uh, you know, like, you'll see that maybe on weightlifters or something like that, where a lot of the surface fat isn't there, uh, and they have a, a lot of musculature, but they can have uh, still significant deposits of adipose tissue uh, in the omentum. Um, 
It also is insulation, keeps your body warm. So that's all the stuff we sort of know uh, that probably all of you know. Uh, but something you're, you may not be familiar with is the fact that baby fat is actually different than adult fat. Um, baby fat is called brown fat. It's called brown fat because uh, it looks brown uh, if you were to inspect uh, that. Uh, tissue versus uh, the fat of um, adults. Uh, this is because, first of all, it has more blood vessels going into it. It's much more highly vascularized. It's filled with these things called uh, mitochondria, which are like the little energy, um, the, the energy production uh, factories in your cells. And we'll talk about those uh, in more detail when we get to metabolism and we talk about how we use energy. Um, and then uh, when this brown fat is stimulated by the um, nervous system, it is quickly mobilized, all right? And that means that that fat uh, is, is able to be thrown out into the bloodstream quite readily um, and is um, available for the rapid... Uh, caloric needs of a, of a growing baby. Um, so uh, I have this pic, this is my daughter there when we were living in, in Texas, and she is uh, got lots of uh, cute baby fat on her, and she uh, happened to um, fortuitously pose next to that uh, statue of the Buddha there that I got. Uh, I was able to snap on my neighbor's uh, deck before she toddled away. Um, and that, that's a pretty good depiction of the difference between white fat and brown fat. So the Buddha uh, is all is white. Uh, they're sort of bleached by the sun. And the fat that's on the Buddha um, is, he, the Buddha is an adult. Uh, it's white fat. And that fat on that statue is not going anywhere quickly at all. It's, it's, it's a nice metaphor. It's stone. Um, it's not going to be mobilized uh, rapidly at all. So White fat is much uh, harder uh, to, to mobilize, whereas uh, my daughter is sort of uh, browned by the sun uh, down there in Texas, and the fat on her will quickly melt away as soon as uh, she learns how to walk in that photo, which uh, was imminent. Uh, so that, that picture uh, is, a, is a nice metaphor to help you understand the difference between those two types of fat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, by the time they've emerged from toddlerhood, most of the, the uh, baby fat has, has melted from their body for the most part. Um, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's just this like store of energy uh, that the baby puts on when it's feeding. So it's like taking all this fat on board when it's nursing. And then there's this shift that happens, these two things that happen at the same time. The baby weans itself, so now it doesn't have this like immediate daily supply of really high fat density food uh, available. When you move to solid food, it solid food tends to be lower fat uh, content than milk, uh, mother's milk. And the, and the other thing that happens at the same time is that uh, there's well a bunch of things that happen. Uh, they start to get teeth, which is uh, how they are able to then process solid food. And the, but the third important thing that happens to them is they go from being this like uh, squalling amoeba that needs you to change their diaper um, to these creatures that suddenly have learned how to either crawl or stand up and run. And uh, that takes a lot of energy. That, that takes a lot of uh, muscle growth and development. Extremely rapid, probably the most rapid uh, that happens uh, throughout lifetime is that transition from uh, a, you know, a, a newborn to uh, a toddler where they're running around. And so all that fat is there to just uh, drive that rapid, that rapid shift that happens in their, in their physiology. And so by the time they've emerged from toddlerhood, there's really not, it, most of it has become white fat at that point. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's because after they've weaned, they don't have access to a, a high-density source of fat the way they did when they were uh, breastfeeding.
I mean, some, some people nurse their children. I had a friend in Detroit that nursed her child until, I don't know, he was like five or something like that. Um, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with that uh, for sure, but that's unusual. Most people, send it, you know, you'll see anywhere from six months to two years, something like that is, or, or maybe three. Uh, they'll still be nursing a little bit, but that's kind of the range that people uh, nurse their child. And then once they emerge from that, once they've weaned, then uh, th then you really see the shift to white fat. Uh, um, okay. There probably could be, it may be, and I certainly don't know, this is me speculating, there may be uh, components in the milk because milk has a lot of really subtle trace. Uh, mother's milk is extremely complex. And, uh, you know, the bulk of it is, you know, lactose and, and proteins and and uh, and lots of fats, but there's you know a, a really wide uh, variety in each of those categories uh, of of nutrients that can have um, subtle physiological effects on the on the ratio of brown to white fat or or whatever. And by removing that, that's can maybe a trigger. So, child that weans earlier may transition out of brown fat sooner. Uh, than one that is later. I don't know that. I'm not even aware of the research, but there must be some, I imagine. Uh, okay, so to summarize everything in this uh, unit, so at first I talked about the structure of uh, free fatty acids. I defined them. Uh, I gave you uh, a, a general structure for a saturated fat, uh, which you see there. There's a, a long uh, carbon chain with an acid uh, functionality on the end. I define the word amphipathic, meaning polar and nonpolar in the same molecule. Uh, then we distinguish between uh, saturated and unsaturated fatty acids within unsaturated. I looked at mono and poly and the different types of poly unsaturated fats, uh, in particular uh, the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. I talked about the various health benefits of those. Um, and then I defined what a trans and a cis fat uh, were. I talked about the essential fatty acids uh, and named uh, a few of each of, the, uh, of each of those two categories, the omega-3s and omega-6s, talked about the ratio uh, between them. And then I made some uh, structural correlations uh, with their melting points, uh, helping you to understand the difference between what a fat is and what an oil is, uh, why one is... Uh, solid at room temperature and one is, is the other and how that correlates to animal versus vegetable fats. Uh, and, I, and then I also talked about, uh, I had a slide sort of banging the drum about atherosclerosis and the role of different fats in, in that. Um, so that was all fatty acids. And then I talked about different ways of packing fatty acids up and shifting them around, which was essentially the second half of uh, the the unit. Uh, so the first way uh, that was achieved was as uh, triglycerides. Uh, I talked about the structure and how and triglycerides are built and then also broken down, uh, acid hydrolysis and then alkaline hydrolysis, uh, alkaline being basic, um, and I called that saponification, which is uh, was how you make soap. Um, and then uh, that was chemical breakdown, and then I moved into enzymatic uh, breakdown uh, of the, the digestion of fats using lipase. Um, and I talked about emulsifying, uh, how emulsification works of triglycerides and fatty acids, uh, the role of cholesterol and glycerol phospholipids in that. I talked about what lipase was. Um, and I also talked about uh, the role of bile salts in forming uh, the me cells. Um, and then I talked about the absorption of uh, fat and the role of the different lipoproteins. And I went through that long uh, sort of schematic progression uh, through the cell. And then today I talked about uh, white fat and brown fat. So that was, uh, that was all the topics sort of uh, in an outline form that I covered today. Any questions on any of that, any of those concepts you want me to revisit here? Okay, good. So let's dive into...
the next unit here. Come on. Computer doesn't want to move as fast as I want to. All right, so we've covered uh, three of the four major uh, categories of biopolymers. Um, we talked about proteins, carbohydrates, proteins, and I guess in the proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids in that order. Um, the only one remaining is nucleic acids, and we will talk about that uh, at the very end as a introduction to the GMO discussion that we're going to have at the end of, of the semester. Uh, but now we have enough to put together, to move up that ladder of life uh, to cells. And um, I'm calling it the three-bedroom apartment of life. Uh, I don't really, I don't know where that came from. I was just <laughs> trying to be witty. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll force the metaphor in a moment. This picture here is a picture of um, a guy named Robert Hooke. Um, Robert Hooke was an uh, interesting character. He's shown uh, here with um, the university that he uh, studied at in, in the background. What is that? Uh, Cambridge, I guess. Uh, no, he studied at Christ Church. So maybe that was... Yeah, right, England, yeah. Um, and in the foreground, you see this uh, microscope, the little red tube with the eyepiece on it. That, that's a depiction <laughs> of his microscope. And then on the back wall behind him, you see all of these uh, detailed pictures. This guy was kind of an artist, is what he actually was, an artist and a naturalist. Uh, and there were a lot of people like that at the time uh, that were able to draw things in the microscopic realm but he wanted to distinguish himself by looking very closely at things, looking uh, at things in close detail. And uh, that is uh, germane to our discussion uh, today because um, he was the first person to really uh, identify a cell. Uh, he, in fact, gave uh, cells the name cell. Uh, the first really um, well-depicted uh, drawing of a cell uh, came from Robert Hooke, and uh, it's what you see on the right-hand side there. Uh, it was uh, a picture of cork. Uh, that is a, a, a tissue sample from the cork plant, and uh, the bark of, of the tree, of the, of the cork tree, which is what we use to make uh, wine corks, etc. He took thin uh, microtomal slices of them, and uh, looked at them through uh, this tiny uh, series of um, microscopes, uh, lenses. And then the thing on the right-hand side in the middle panel uh, are these other lenses that helped him uh, focus the light of the sun. So he used the light of the sun uh, to illuminate the uh, samples that he was looking at underneath uh, his, his microscope. And it, it was only a 30x microscope, but he was still able to see a remarkable amount of detail there. Uh, he named them cells because they reminded him of the cells that, uh, that monks would live in in a Christian abbey, uh, such as the one you see up in the, in the corner uh, up there. It's these tiny little rooms. So in an abbey, it would just be square after square after square after square, almost like a beehive or whatever. And uh, the regular array of them that he saw reminded him uh, of what he observed in the cork plant. And you can sort of see how that looks like that in that uh, depiction of, of the cork that he drew there. Uh, square room after square room. Robert Hook. <clears throat> All right. Uh, and here are some of the uh, types of picture, other pictures that he would drew. He drew very detailed uh, pictures of flies uh, with the minute detail that uh, wouldn't have been possible without his, uh, without his microscope. Uh, in 1665, he published this book, The Micrographia, uh, which, in which uh, it, this was really the first book of uh, microscope uh, anatomy, microscopic anatomy. So a, a, a watershed and understanding of cells. So where are we now? Um, uh, here uh, is a just a general depiction of what an epithelial cell uh, 
uh, may look like. And I'll, I probably should switch this with this, the slide in front of it, the next slide, uh, get the order different. But uh, we'll talk about exactly what epithelial cells are. But for the moment, let's just think of it as a generalized cell. This is just a, a general depiction of, of any kind of cell that you might see. Specifically, uh, the kind of cell that we're going to, is going to be important in the digestive tract. We've already kind of met some epithelial cells. We called them enterocytes, didn't we? The cells that lined uh, the gut. And we'll look at those in a little bit uh, more detail uh, in, in a bit here. But epithelial cells. So uh, in particular, epithelial cells uh, have a polarity to them. And when I say this, I'm not talking about a hydrophobic, hydrophilic, or positive, negatively charged. I just mean up and down. Um, there is a, a apical surface, uh, which is the top end, and uh, we, we typically depict it as top. We call it the apical surface. And then there's the basolateral surface on the very bottom. Uh, and the basolateral surface is the point of attachment for that epithelial cell to some underlying connective tissue. Epithelial, epithelium is uh, really, it's always associated with some sort of connective tissue. On this apical surface, uh, there can be all kinds of different structures that increase the surface area of that epithelial cell to a greater or lesser degree or serve other purposes. So on uh, the, the cell on the left, we have these things called um, microvilli, uh, singular microvilus. And a microvilus, the job of a microvilus is, is absolutely to increase the surface area of that epithelial cell. Uh, the importance of that is to affect greater surface for molecular exchange. All right? So the more surface area there, there is, the more exchange you can have, just like at a, at a bank, uh, the more teller windows that are open, the more traffic they can do through that portal, all right? Um, the, the bigger your cable, the more information can be sent, whatever. It's, it's the same sort of thing. The greater the surface area of, on the surface of the apical uh, surface of the cell, the more chemical exchange that can happen. And that uh, alludes to the function of uh, the epithelial cell. Often epithelial cells are either absorbing something into the cell or they're secreting or excreting something outside of the cell, all right? And that's their primary job. And we want to make them as efficient at that as possible. We don't want some cellular product uh, to have to wait in line. So we need to increase that surface area. Um, or likewise, maybe there's a bunch of food in the gut. We don't want it to pass on down the line and out of the body without having the chance to absorb it. So having uh, as equal or, or as great an opportunity for the absorption of any nutrient as possible uh, is a real advantage and an ideal. Um, this, the, you see on the cell on the right-hand side, the cilia, uh, these are much larger than microvilli. They're almost like long arms that can stick out, a whole bunch of them, long uh, sort of uh, on the left-hand side, you can think of it as a brush cut, and on the right-hand side, you can think of it as dreadlocks. These long, uh, these long uh, <laughs> tendrils that stick out, and and those uh, do increase the surface area of the cell. But also importantly, these uh, cilia can often have motor proteins in them that can make them move. They can wave, not in like a coordinated way where they're going to reach over, grab something, and pull it in but they're often all moving sort of in the same direction uh, like this. For example, uh, you have uh, cilia that line your trachea, and they're constantly uh, waving upward. That's your windpipe uh, upward uh, towards your uh, mouth and pharynx, and nasopharynx. Uh, they call it the mucociliary escalator, um, which is kind of a, a charming name, like a mucus escalator. So it's bringing... Uh, mucus up and out. If you inhale some kind of dust particle or smudge or whatever, uh, and it, it adheres to the mucousy lining of the windpipe, this mucociliary escalator will, uh, with time, just slowly bring uh, that uh, junk up, and you'd expectorate it, and it wouldn't actually lodge down in the lung where it would occlude your ability to breathe, for example. Um, so cilia, cilia uh, do all sorts of things uh, like that along that same line. And we will find them in the GI tract. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit. 
So in the cell, um, this is why I call it the three-bedroom uh, apartment of life. Um, there are there's the, the overall cell, and there are really three distinct compartments uh, in the cell, and there are subdivisions within that. But there's three distinct uh, compartments. Uh, the first group of apartments are uh, going to be uh, vesicle membrane delimited vesicles. Uh, a vesicle is just sort of a bubble, uh, and they have membrane around them, but they're inside the cell. Uh, so little bubbles of membrane, and uh, we have uh, various sorts. We have vesicles. Uh, these vesicles uh, are just little bubbles that uh, may contain secretions. Maybe the cell's job is to make uh, stomach acid or some, some sort of protein uh, for digestion, and they're packed into those bubbles, and those bubbles will eventually merge with the outer membrane and release those, okay? Uh, another type of this sort of uh, membrane delimited structure would be the Golgi apparatus or the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, these two, we don't need to go into depth as to what those two really do that much in this class, uh, but uh, just, I guess, the, the short answer as to what the, their function is, is that's where proteins are made and then modified for uh, potential export um, to the rest of outside of the cell or to somewhere else in the cell. Um, so all of that is the first bedroom that I talked about. The second bedroom is the nucleus. So it's the large membrane delimited uh, area in the center of a cell that's easily visible uh, in, a, in a microscope. And <clears throat> this is where uh, DNA and R, uh, this is where the DNA resides, the nucleic acid, the genetic material resides. Um, so this is probably a good time to just refresh you guys from high school biology or whatever, whenever you came across it, of the genetic paradigm. Because um, this will be, you'll need to understand that when we talk about GMO. So the basic genetic paradigm is uh, that cell has DNA. Uh, there's this double helix of, of DNA structure. We'll talk about it more later. Uh, but this uh, encodes uh, the sequence for all the proteins in your body. Uh, and the way we get from DNA to uh, protein is by way of another type of molecule called RNA. So DNA can be replicated. There, there's three processes. There's replication where we're going to make copies of DNA that stay in the nucleus uh, and then a cell will divide after there's replication. So now you have two cells, each with their own set of DNA. So that's a special process. Um, and then DNA can be transcribed. Uh, transcription is um, taking, so for example, uh, these words come from, uh, are borrowed from literature. If you are to transcribe something, you are going to make a copy of it. All right. Um, but in, in, you're going to perhaps update the language, update the language, put it into your own word. So it's not an exact replication. It's not an exact copy. It's uh, into the same paradigm, but you're maybe updating the language to be, you know, understood more readily, like going from Old English to New English with Beowulf or something like that. Um, and uh, in this, in the metaphor here, uh, describes going from DNA to RNA. So RNA is a nucleic acid. Uh, the ribose in it is, in DNA, is deoxy, uh, whereas in RNA it is not deoxy. You guys have enough chemistry now to uh, know what that means. Um, and the DNA really can't live, leave the nucleus, uh, but the RNA can leave the nucleus, and it does leave the nucleus as this type of uh, RNA called mRNA, you'll see the little arrow going from uh, the box in the middle of the screen uh, nucleus up to the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, that mRNA, mRNA travels from the nucleus after it's been uh, transcribed from the DNA, and it goes to the, R, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum outside the cell, or I'm sorry, outside of the nucleus, um, where uh, that mRNA is used uh, as the template to make protein uh, in these structures called um, ribosomes. But, um, yeah, we don't need to go into that. 
Um, so that's, that's the genetic paradigm. DNA to RNA, RNA uh, to protein. Um, the third bedroom of life uh, is the mitochondria. And it's these, uh, there are these special uh, vesicular compartments that you see that look like uh, little critters on the bottom of the cell over there. And it turns out that they are little critters. Um, mitochondria, maybe I'm anticipating what I'll probably cover in, in more detail in metabolism, but mitochondria are where we make the actual energy in our cells, where we produce uh, ATP. It's a molecule that is produced by the breakdown of the glucose that we eat. Um, and mitochondria themselves were uh, bacteria uh, that uh, in ancient times, uh, many millions of years ago at, at the birth of eukaryotic life, uh, infected eukaryotic cells and then like, hey, I kind of like it here. And they set up a symbiotic relationship. Uh, so they were prokaryotes that invaded the cells um, and, of eukaryotes, uh, eukaryotes being cells that have nuclei. Uh, prokaryotes are cells that don't have nuclei, basically bacteria. Um, and mitochondria, the thing that's interesting about mitochondria is this is where you make your energy production. It's all, mitochondria also have, because they invaded the cells uh, separately from the evolution of a cell uh, and, its, and its DNA, they have their own DNA. Um, so you have really two sets of DNA in your cell. You have your nuclear DNA that encodes all of the big structures in your cell. And then there's mitochondrial DNA that just governs uh, the mitochondria in your cell. What's interesting about this, however, is that um, you only have, so in your nuclear DNA, you have your half of your DNA is your mom's, half of it is your dad's, right? We all uh, are aware of that. Uh, we all look a little bit like uh, some like our mom, some like our dad. Uh, but in uh, the mitochondria, you only have your mom's mitochondrial DNA, only. And uh, if you were able to look at your mitochondria, it would only look like your mom, and it would look exactly like your mom's. Uh, and the reason for this is that um, mitochondria are not present in sperm. Uh, mitochondria are present in the much larger egg that's produced by your mother, uh, but sperm uh, that come from the male uh, don't have mitochondria in them. Sperm are sort of these like uh, these uh, one-time rocket ships that are meant to swim out into the great beyond, and they have one very well-defined task, um, and they're not meant to live for a long period of time. They just have to swim, find the egg, uh, and, uh, and fuse with it. So there are no mitochondria there. All your mitochondria come from your mom. All right, there, that was an information-dense slide, kind of a, a whirlwind of intro biology for you guys. Um, okay, so tissues. There are four types of tissues in the body, four broad categories. Um, they're epithelial tissue, connective tissue, neural tissue, and muscle tissue. Uh, we don't really need to know about the three uh, connective, neural, and muscle tissue in any kind of great detail because uh, we're not, this isn't a physiology class, um, but I will just talk about them a little bit. A tissue itself is just a collection of cells and cell products uh, that are going to have a very uh, tightly defined function. All right, so uh, first epithelial cell. And the, the job of an epithelial cell is somehow cover an exposed surface, um, and this can line passageways, uh, such as your mouth, your gut tube, uh, your vagina, the uterus, um, the, the surface of your skin, uh, the tubes inside, uh, the nephrons of the kidneys, etc. They form glands as well. Uh, so, uh, for example, the ceruminous glands that make earwax, or the mammary glands that produce milk, or the sweat glands on your skin that produce sweat. All of those are just 
specialized epithelial cells that cover some sort of uh, compartment that are going to make that are going to secrete some sort of product like cerumen, the earwax, or sweat, or whatever it is, the milk, whatever it is that the gland is producing, uh, and then they're going to release them out into that into the compartment of the gland, and then it's going to leave that compartment and uh, go and do whatever that um, cellular product was meant to do. So epithelial cells uh, line surfaces and form glands. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely epithelial cells uh, in in lymph nodes. Yep, that line the surface of the the lymphatic ducts, and et cetera. Not they're not completely made of epithelial uh, tissue. In fact, there is no organ or organ system that is made of only one of any of these. Okay, so all organs and all organ systems are typically have all four types of tissue present there, or at least at least two or three of them, okay? Um, but we're going to be, we're going to talk about epithelial tissue. We already have talked about some epithelial tissue. Um, they, they cover sur exposed surfaces and they line internal passageways. Um, connective tissue is a complicated category that is basically the glue of the body. Um, it can do a number of other functions. Neural tissue is obviously nerves. And muscle tissue is, is also probably pretty familiar to you guys. The neural tissue and the muscle tissue are uh, both the excitable cells, and then the connective and epithelial tissue is not non-excitable cells. All right. Some background so we can have a, a conversation. Uh, here's some history on the GI tract. So the, the rest of this is now going to be, for the next lecture and a half, is going to be me telling you how your GI tract works. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit of the history. We could probably spend several lectures just going over the history, but here's some of the fun parts. Um, the understanding of the GI tract uh, suffered for a long time because of its association with uh, the lower functions of the body, excretion, <laughs> feces, right? Um, and this isn't just a, a Western phenomenon. Uh, even in Vedic teaching from India, there's this notion of the chakras that move up the body. And as you move up the body, uh, up the chakras, you're moving up in sort of uh, the virtue of that chakra uh, the, in terms of the, uh, the, the nobility of that, of that chakra. So the lower chakras are more base, more animal, less clean. And then the higher chakras are associated with... Uh, enlightenment. Um, and we can see that here in uh, uh, five years after uh, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue by this quote from a guy named Alessandro Benedetti who uh, studied, he was an anatomist that studied at the University of Padua in, in uh, Italy. Um, and uh, this is what he says about the stomach. The stomach is the lowest and has a hidden place in the body because of its uncleanness, as though nature had spared the principal members and had relegated the stomach or bowels farther away from the sight of reason and of the mind, fenced it off with the diaphragm in order not to disturb the rational part of the mind with its importunity. These members serve the higher ones. Some of them concoct the food into juice, Others digest it into various humors. Others expel the superfluity. Um, so even though he has this uh, real disdainful take on the GI tract, uh, he, he's getting s some of the like basic functional components uh, right here. So uh, the stomach concocts the food into juice. Uh, we, you add fluid to it. Um, and... Uh, it gets digested into various humors. By humors, I think he is uh, perhaps humorously uh, referring to the gaseous uh, components of the intestines. And then others explu uh, expel, not explu, I don't know what that means, expel the superfluity, uh, right, so the feces. Uh, da Vinci <clears throat> has a, a similar take here. So, um, 
Except that he thought, this is funny, I had to add this because I thought this was pretty uh, a pretty humorous um, aspect of, of it all. Uh, da Vinci thought that the, he still was laboring under this idea of the four elements, uh, Aristotle's four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, right? And he thought that the role of the lungs was to cool the body. That was the job of the lungs. It was to cool the body because... <sighs> As you're breathing, it kind of feels cool in your mouth, and your breath is warm. You're expelling heat somehow. That's what he thought the lungs. Um, and uh, he thought, amongst other things, that the digestive system aided the respiratory system in this function of like. Uh, so let me put a finer point on it: of, of blowing air off the body and cooling the body. Uh, the the quote. <laughs> Compressed intestines with the condensed air which is generated in them thrust the diaphragm upwards. The diaphragm compresses the lungs and expresses the air. Um, so he's talking about belching and farting here is what, he, what, what he's talking about. I thought that was uh, kind of fun. Our, our thought of the Vitruvian man um, coming to terms with his own flatulence. All right. Uh, the GI system overview. Well, um, it processes and digests food, of course, uh, but it also absorbs uh, and conserves water, um, and much more than you you would imagine. Um, in the uh, in the process of digesting food, it also needs to absorb the nutrients that are released by that digestion, and this includes ions, water. Uh, and then any of the smaller uh, sugars, protein, amino acids, and uh, fatty acids uh, that are, are released. And then one final thing is the liver is considered to be part of the digestive system, uh, and the liver is an important site of storage for glycogen, uh, so and, and also fat uh, gets stored in the liver. So uh, the that part of the digestive system, importantly, uh, serves as an energy storage, uh, an ener a pool of energy reserves. Um, just the anatomy of it starts with the mouth, the, the oral cavity, the, the teeth, the tongue. Uh, we have the various salivary glands, which we'll talk about a bit. Um, and then it goes through this pharynx, which is the back of your throat, down through the esophagus, uh, into the stomach. Uh, where uh, the food is uh, exposed to acid. Um, then we have the liver and the pancreas, uh, which are both going to uh, make components that are going to help in the breakdown, the digestion of the food. Uh, stomach passes <clears throat> into the small intestines, which uh, have three portions uh, where most of the nutrients are absorbed. And then we have a passage into the large intestine where most of the water is absorbed. Uh, before uh, the, at this point, feces uh, passes into the rectum and <coughs> anus for uh, expulsion from the body. <coughs> All right, on to taste. So uh, um, I had wanted, well, let's, let, me, let me make my point here first. Um, so the way taste works, people, the, the thinking on this has evolved. Uh, when I, well, I don't know, maybe... Maybe some people had appreciated it when I was your age, but maybe not. I don't actually know when they first had worked this out. Um, probably, certainly in the popular culture when I was your age, uh, thought that uh, tastes resided certain, there, there are four, when I was your age, there were seen to be four, but now we recognize five distinct categories of uh, taste receptors. And... Um, they used to think that uh, salty lived on this, or sweet lived on the tip of your tongue, and salty was on the side of your tongue, and and tart was in the back, or whatever. They had this map uh, for the different parts of your tongue that were going to taste uh, the various uh, uh, taste modalities. Uh, but that is not the current thinking any longer. Uh, at the beginning of the semester, we looked at taste buds. Uh, we looked at we visualized taste buds and found that. Well, Zane, were you a, a super taster? Oh, Christian was. You were. Yeah, I knew one of you was. Right. So some of you had different distributions of taste buds uh, in the class. Turns out all taste buds uh, have 
all the, the capacity to, to, to sensate all taste modalities. So if you look closely at a taste bud, this is this rainbow thing on the right hand side. Uh, you'll see these different color codes and, the, and uh, a taste bud is a collection of taste sensory receptors that are bundled together in this little bud, um, descriptively called a bud, uh, that's embedded in the, in the flesh of your tongue. Um, and uh, some of those are going to be responsive to sweet, some to savory, umami, the glutamate uh, taste. Some are going to respond to salt, others to sour, bitter, etc. Um, and then those cell bodies are going to have project. They're nerve cells. They're going to have uh, projections that pass through uh, the various what are called cranial nerves up to the brain. And uh, the brain interprets a taste as sweet because of the line of the nerve that it's coming along. All right, so there's this labeled line code. Um, if you were somehow able to take and sever the axonal body uh, of this line of a sweet and reconnect it to a salty, when you tasted something sweet, uh, you would actually sensate it, you would interpret it as salty, all right? That's not a real thing, but um, it's, I'm using it to help you understand this notion of labeled line code. Uh, so your body, your, your body interprets a sensation because it's mapped a particular uh, sensory modality, a, a taste modality, onto that particular uh, flavor uh, code as it, oh, class is over, um, as it passes up to the gustatory cortex. All right. So we will pick up with taste uh, next time, and we'll take, this is the beginning of our trip down the GI track. It'll probably take me another lecture and a half to finish that, uh, and then we'll be pretty ready for Thanksgiving, I think. Uh, hold on a sec. Uh, I am going to post the lab for Friday. I just got confirmation that we will have all of our... Uh, reagents for Friday, so we're going to do this uh, antioxidant lab with the chocolate. Hopefully it'll work. I'm just now getting the reagents, and I'm going to post the lab. I'm going to try to post it today. Uh, for that lab on Friday to work, you need to take a peek at it first. So I'll post that up. Uh, take a look at the lab so you understand what you're doing when you walk into lab on Friday. Make sense? Yes, Damon.